Hi everyone, um, welcome to the concluding session of the ENCODE Euler Educate series. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the previous section sessions as much as uh, as much as I have. Um, and today we've got the wonderful, the incomparable Doug Hoyt returning to us once again um, to take us through some of the unique features of the Ethereum Vault connector. Um, I'm really excited to hear what Doug's got to say, and I'm sure you are too. So over to you, Doug. Thanks. Like I said, the, today we're going to be talking about the um, unique features of the Ethereum Vault connector. So this is the the, the third uh, workshop of the series and the last one. Um, I'm just going to begin by doing a short recap of what the EVC is, uh, and then we'll start to talk about some of the things that make it um, kind of you know interesting and unique. So uh, if you remember, the uh, EVC is kind of like a, a framework contract, right? And it's um, uh, you know, small, tries to be as minimal as possible while accomplishing its goals. And uh, it's also permissionless and ownerless. Um, so it's uh, in some sense like a public good contract that we hope that many different people and protocols and companies will um, integrate with because uh, uh, it, it, the idea is to create a, sort of an ecosystem around this thing. Um, and obviously it's in the name, it's a vault connector. Remember it's uh, connecting 46, 26 volts with each other to maintain a relationship between the vaults for the purposes of lending primarily. Um, and then just as a refresher, uh, their um, vaults can function as two roles and it, uh, they can simultaneously do this as well, right? Um, the, the first role is as a controller vault, right? Now this is the vault that uh, funds or tokens are borrowed out of, right? So uh, if you want to borrow from uh, an EVC compatible vault, you will go to go to it and set yourself as a controller. And then you, at that point, um, you're allowed to actually uh, take out the tokens that you've borrowed as long as you have sufficient collateral, okay? Um, and the reason why it was called a controller, of course, is because you're giving this uh, contract control um, over all the collateral assets that you have associated in the network here, okay? Um, and just to recap again, the trust boundary here is that users should only trust, uh, use trusted controllers, that is. Um, because, you know, just exactly like uh, when you deposit into, for example, Aave or any other uh, compound or any other uh, lending protocol, you're, um, you know, relying on the fact that if you repay your loan, you'll be able to take out your collateral again, right? It's the same, exact same, uh, it's the exact same trust uh, uh, interface there. Um, and then, yeah, just continuing on uh, with the, the recap, the other uh, role that vaults can function as is as the collateral, okay? And uh, as I said, a vault can be a collateral as well as a controller for different users, right? So one user could be putting uh, using a vault as a collateral uh, to borrow from its entirely separate vault, and other users could be borrowing from this particular vault and setting it as a controller, okay? Um, and yeah, it's, it's up to each user to decide which vaults they want to set, uh, put into their uh, collateral set, okay? And, and the, um, the interesting um, thing that the EVC provides is that uh, if a controller decides that the, your funds should be seized because you aren't satisfying whatever the agreement was for the, the loan, and usually to keep your collateral value high enough, it can actually communicate with the controller vaults and withdraw the funds. And that's the mechanism for liquidations. Um, and then just a reminder of the trust boundary again here, controllers should only use or, or rely on the fact that um, trusted vaults uh, are, should function as collateral, right? Uh, because um, they're relying on the fact that during a liquidation, they will actually be able to seize, these, to, to seize the uh, underlying asset of the vault, okay? So that's the other uh, trust boundary. Okay. Now that the recap is uh, over, and we'll get into some of the actual unique features. Uh, the, the first one is uh, kind of a carry on from Euler v1, where we had a quite similar mechanism. Um, and the idea is that, uh, especially with EOAs, that's just like regular Ethereum accounts, like your MetaMask account, for example, um, uh, you don't have as much flexibility to uh, create different positions, okay? Uh, now, if you remember from previously, at any one given time, you can only have, uh, be associated with one controller uh, in the EVC, okay? Um, I think I mentioned last time is that that's not strictly true in the middle of a transaction. You could actually temporarily have two at once, but by the end of that transaction, you need to have solved it and make sure you only have one. Otherwise, the transaction fails. So 
Uh, by and large, you can think of it being as each account can only have one controller at a time. And the implication of that is that you can only have one borrower at a time, right? So if you wanted to have multiple different positions uh, concurrently, then it, it would be a problem, right? Um, you could do this by you know creating different smart contract wallets and each one giving each one of them a position, but it's not as good of a, it's not as nice of a user experience as what we're providing here. Uh, the way that sub accounts actually work in the EBC is by taking uh, every uh, by giving every Ethereum address 256 kind of virtual accounts, um, and from the perspective of all vaults that use the EBC, these accounts are entirely isolated from each other. Okay, so uh, your sub account zero, for example, we we give them numbers. Um, from zero to 255 inclusive, your sub account zero is entirely isolated from sub account one. Okay. Um, and that lets you, you know, um, set up positions with entirely different risk profiles and so on in your step separate sub accounts and not, uh, and, and in no, under no circumstances can a borrow on sub account one, you know, a, a seize collateral that was only posted on sub account zero, right? That's what we mean by isolation. Um, in terms of the actual underlying mechanism of how we do it, is uh, just by simply taking your Ethereum address and uh, you know uh, basically treating it as a uint um, and cast uh, and then XORing the sub account ID with it, right? Uh, so I'll show you in the next slide what that looks like. But basically, it means that the first 19 bytes of your address, remember Ethereum bytes are uh, Ethereum addresses are 20 bytes long or 40 hexadecimal characters. Um, but what it means is the first 19 bytes of all your sub accounts addresses are the same, right? And it's just that last byte that changes and uh, any valid last byte is a valid sub account, right? Um, so the, the really nice thing about this is that it's abstracted by the EBC and vaults themselves don't know or care about which accounts are sub accounts of, uh, of a different, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the same user, right? So the, remember we said that the EBC handles all the authentication for you. Uh, if you're a vault and you code to the EBC specs, which you did in workshop two, then um, you can rely on the fact that yes, this has been authenticated because the EVC has done that for you. If we look into the, the mechanism here, this is just to illustrate it a little bit um, more detail what I said. It, imagine you, this is your uh, address at the top. Um, do you see that the last byte is 2B, okay? Um, we call this particular address, your, you know, your real um, uh, Ethereum address, the sub account zero address. If uh, we XOR one with it, the, that gives you a sub account one address and so on with two, right? Uh, and as you can see, uh, you know, if you if you understand the properties of XOR, you'll realize that you can set that by choosing the right sub account um, ID, you can set that last byte to anything, okay? So the, the, the easy test to see if two of these addresses are the, um, of the same owner is just to look at the first 19 bytes. Um, and it, uh, another thing just to note is that the sub account addresses should never escape into any other system, right? They're kind of like internal to the EVC. Uh, because obviously if you did send tokens by accident to, um, a sub account address, that's not sub account zero, those tokens will be burned. Right. So it, it's, it purely has to be contained within the EVC. Okay. Um, onto the next, uh, feature that the EVC provides is this concept of operators and, um, each sub account gets, you know, their own operator set. So, uh, you can choose to put different operators on different sub accounts. What operators are, are other addresses that you are giving um, access to make um, uh, operations on your behalf, okay? Um, and that should go without saying then that this should be like uh, somewhat of a trusted address, right? Because if you just gave, you know, some arbitrary uh, person uh, as an operator, then they could just withdraw your funds, right? So, so don't do that. So make sure, uh, you know, well, typically what you will do is use a um, well audited, trusted smart contract to uh, install as an operator, right? But there are some cases where you might want to put an EOA or a multi-sig um, that I'll explain in a second. Uh, you can almost think of uh, operators as being a type of controller, right? Because similar to controllers, you're giving them like access to perform operations on your behalf. But the critical difference between controllers and operators is that uh, you can remove your operators at any point in time, okay? Whereas controllers, as we said, you have to get the permission of the controller vault, right? In fact, the controller vault is the one who uh, removes you uh, directly, right? Often you will call into the controller vault and say, please remove me, and then it will check to make sure that you have no outstanding borrows and then remove you. 
but ultimately it's the controller vault that uh, does the removal, right? Whereas operator is you, you, um, you remove yourself at any time you want, right? It's your it's your, at your discretion. Some use cases of operators are uh, as follows. As I said, sometimes you might want to, in fact, install uh, like an EOA or multisig. Uh, one uh, most likely it's what you control or some you know trusted operator who controls them on your behalf, like some trusted uh, you know like an, maybe it's an, a company account and it's an employee of the uh, of the company or something. Um, but one thing you might do is uh, you know have um, uh, hot wallets, right? And you could give that a hot wallet access to like one of the sub accounts funds, for example, right? Or if uh, you install a smart contract as the operator and, you know, and like make basically like a smart wallet, but limit the type of operations it actually do, then you could actually, you know, make it so that you um, have a hot wallet that can only do, let's say, um, different uh, trading operations, but it can't actually withdraw the funds, right? Uh, as an extra layer of, layer of security, okay? Um, and you might also use that mechanism to have some sort of like emergency closeout. Uh, and there, you could think of, uh, in fact, companies that uh, you, you delegate as operators and their sole job is to, you know, monitor for market conditions or smart contract bugs or something. And if as soon as they see it, to try to withdraw as much as possible on your behalf, right? Um, as, and, and you might pay them a monthly fee as a monitoring contract or something like that. Uh, that's another use case. Um, but another really powerful use case is uh, an integration with these things that are commonly called keepers. Okay, and, and a keeper is somebody who monitors the uh, blockchain for um, uh, operations and then does them, um, you know, on whoever requests them's behalf, right? Um, and, and, and you know, there's lots of different use cases for operate uh, for keepers. Sometimes like updating price feeds and so on. Um, but one thing that we think is a really neat use case is if you install a custom operator that allows these uh, keepers to um, update certain uh, attributes of, of your orders, then you can implement lots of different things like, for example, uh, order modifiers and things like, for example, stop losses. Um, so let me explain what a, a stop loss is. It, it's basically when you have a position, um, you know, like as we talked about in, in the first uh, workshop, typically like a leverage position, um, if the price of your collateral uh, that you have installed goes down or the price of your liability goes up, at some point you will become unhealthy and you'll be subject to liquidation, right? Um, and, and usually, and then when you're liquidated, you know, typically you will have lost, um, you know, some amount of your position because of the price movements, right? Um, stop losses are basically just closing out your position automatically before you get to that point. Okay, so if the price is moved against you at a certain level, if you install a stop loss on your account, then you will immediately, you know, um, close the position. In other words, uh, you know, withdraw your collateral, swap it, and use that for payback or liability, and keep whatever is left over. Okay, um, uh, and a take profit is just the opposite of it. It's like when the price gets to a certain level uh, in your favor, then you close it out, right? Um, and the idea behind that is that if you're trading, for example, you might um, see the price is moving in your favor and, uh, but not, uh, or sorry, you might, the, the price might move in your favor, but you're not there to watch it yourself. And you want to just be automatically take that profit off the table because obviously it could go down again after, right? So that, that's the, that, those are uh, take profits and stop losses. And the way that they function um, in an EVC ecosystem it, is an operator uh, is installed that it has you know very minimal functions of what it can do, uh, but one of them is that that you install these uh, take profit and stop losses um, uh, parameters, and then it will have the permission to close out your position, and that's it, right? Uh, so those are some things that you, you can you, that you can do with operators. Uh, another really popular um, type of um, order modifier is a trailing stop, and this can also be accomplished by keeper based operators. Uh, a, a trailing stop is essentially a stop loss. However, if the price moves in your favor, the stop loss itself adjusts. Um, it, it adjusts uh, and increases as well, right? So, if, I mean, this is a very rough graph of it, but uh, you can see that as the solid line, the price is going up, so is the uh, stop losses. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, when the price is going down, I mean, this isn't exactly depicting it right, but it should be exactly flat line, right? Uh, you know, the stop loss stays steady, 
right? Yeah, the, uh, and then of course, if the price goes down and hits that stop loss, it, it functions as a regular uh, stop loss, right? Um, yeah, uh, the point of a trailing stop, of course, is just so that uh, you can um, take as much profit as possible by allowing the price to go up. But as soon as the price uh, goes down by some threshold, you close it out, right? So you have like basically uh, unlimited upside, but a you know a restricted downside, and crucially, you don't lose any of that like uh, unrealized profit from a price movement. Uh, question in the chat about operators and how do they mitigate against uh, MEV? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And a little bit of, that's a little bit out of the scope of how the um, EVC functions. And you could create different operators that, uh, you know, for example, you could make it so that only privileged uh, keepers could function, like privileged addresses and so on. So there's basically any kind of countermeasure that you might want to install against MEV, you could implement with a, a, an operator. Uh, but it's a little bit of a scope of the EVC and what I'm talking about today. But it is a very good question. Uh, so that's trailing stops. And that's one of the things that you can accomplish with operators. Um, another another thing, way that I like to phrase it a little bit is uh, if you go back and think about what how our definition of a stop loss was, is it's basically pretty much the same as a liquidation, right? It's just sort of an opt-in liquidation because when the price moves against you, you close out your position, right? Um, it, it's just that uh, you have done it at like a, a less favorable or like a, a more favorable price than the liquidation would have happened, right? Um, and, and the really interesting thing about that is that, uh, you know, by, you could have a whole bunch of, there could be a marketplace, an entire different like um, uh, array of different types of operators that perform these self-directed liquidations for you, right? So um, normally when you are liquidated, it's based on your health score. Right. So as I said, that is affected by your collateral price and your liability price. Right. However, if you're trading, maybe you want to make it so that uh, it only uh, the, the stop loss is triggered based on only movement of the uh, liability. Right. Um, and also you could uh, you could use custom oracles for this. Right. Even if the um, vault is using a particular oracle, you and you know the deal between you and the uh, keeper who is performing this opt in liquidation could be based on uh, entirely different oracles. Right. Um, and obviously keepers have to get paid. So, uh, you know, typically you'll have to give them some kind of tip. Usually liquidations end up giving like a percentage of the actual seized amount, which potentially could be quite large. Uh, but often keepers would be willing to do that for less, maybe even a flat fee. So uh, there's a lot more flexibility when you have these like kind of self-directed liquidations. OK. Um, but yeah, as I said, you obviously still need um, a liquidation system to uh, keep the protocol secure. Right. So that will still have to exist to safeguard lenders. Um, but the nice thing is if the self-directed liquidations are, you know, popular and, and, and useful and customizable and, and so on, uh, then, you know, maybe you can simplify the liquidation, just make it more aggressive. So we'll have more information about that when we unveil the Vault uh, kit. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of a recap from the first workshop too, but uh, just when we're talking about liquidations, uh, just helpful to remind of the function of, uh, of how they work, right? And it, remember that the EVC handles the authentication. And when a controller vault wants to seize um, a collateral, it goes to the EVC and basically impersonates that user. Uh, and the EVC allows it because of the controller relationship. Uh, and at that point, the controller vault will typically withdraw the collateral, right? And uh, send it to the liquidator and so on. Right. So this is just another example of how authentication uh, is functioned by the EVC. By the way, if you'll notice that all of the things we've been talking about so far are essentially authentication, right? This is authentication. Uh, the sub accounts are authentication, operator authentication. This is really the core uh, feature set of the EVC. But there's one other very useful and important uh, feature of the uh, EVC um, called batches. Okay. And as I said before, you can almost think of the EVC as being kind of like a glorified multi-call, right? Remember, a multi-call is just a contract that you send, you know, um, a list of different operations you want to perform uh, to, and it does each one of those on your behalf. So you can do multiple things in one atomic transaction, okay? Uh, the EVC is that, but kind of like plus a little bit, uh, mostly because of how it interacts with the, um, the, the controller collateral relationship. Um, so a batch is what we call uh, that group of uh, transactions. Um, and um, there's a bunch of reasons why you'd use batches. Number one, you can actually take advantage of subaccounts, right? If you're talking to vaults directly, you can only use your own main address, right? Because you can't send 
a real transaction from a subaccount address. They're kind of fake, remember? Uh, or they're derived. Um, so you can use any of your subaccounts. You can perform any operations atomically. That's like one of the main features of a multi-call. Um, and you know, very important is you can uh, defer the liquidity checking until the end of the batch, right? So that that that, as we said before, allows you to do things like set up a leverage position um, without needing like the initial cap, like without having to do the looping that we described, okay, in the first one. Uh, and there's also different conditions that you can enforce inside of a batch uh, that we'll we'll get to uh, in a second. Uh, quick question in the chat here is if Euler will be releasing keepers or if uh, expected to be done by partners and providers. Um, we'll, we'll have more information on that in the future. I think it will be a combination, right? There will be some like sample ones and maybe a, 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 a start of a network that, uh, that, that we're uh, suggesting. But uh, definitely, this is something that I think the wider community will participate in and have even better ideas than we do. So I, I think it'll be a combination. Let's discuss how to actually use batches. This is the interface for a batch, right? There's this one function, uh, batch, um, and I left off like some stuff here, obviously, to be external and whatever, but uh, there's this one function batch, and uh, by the way, it returns nothing, um, and it takes an array of uh, items. Each item is a batch item, uh, which is this batch item struct, right? And uh, there are these different parameters. Uh, e each one is kind of just like an entry in a multi-call uh, because you're basically doing a call like the EVC low-level opcode on each one of these uh, target contracts, okay? Uh, and uh, you're pass, and if you think about it like that, then value and data also make sense, right? It's basically just passing value, which is the amount of ether you want to send or the native token you want to send to this contract you're invoking via call. Um, and by, uh, sorry, data are the uh, is the call data data that you're passing to that call, right? So. Uh, the batch function will execute each one of those in sequence, right? Just call tar contract using this value in this call data, right? The the only um, slight interesting uh, uh, bit or the only difference from a regular um, multi-call is this on behalf of account, okay? And this is how the authentication is, uh, this is like the source of the authentication, what's actually being authenticated, uh, you know, if you just wanted to put your own address there, uh, then that would obviously always work, right? Uh, but you can also put sub accounts, right? And if you put sub accounts from the same address that you created this batch transaction from, it will be allowed by the UBC because obviously you are uh, you are allowed to make operations on your own sub accounts, right? Um, but there's also a few other uh, like little uh, interesting interactions. If you are installed as an operator for you know one or more accounts, you can actually invoke them with this method too, right? So you set the um, address of the uh, of the the user who installed you as an operator, and you can make the modifications, right? You can make the operations even if you're doing several of them. Uh, question from the chat was: Would it make sense to use batches for building training bots? Yes, it would. <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, I'll get to that. Uh, so this is the batch interface. It's, as I said, a glorified multi-call. Um, but there's a little bit more to it. Mostly, as I said, how it relates to the controller collateral relationships. Okay, And um, that those relationships are enforced uh, with these things called status checks. Okay, um, the, from the vault's perspective, as you saw in workshop two, it's relatively simple to implement um, a vault that uh, conforms to this. Uh, this is the mechanics of it. Whenever a vault does some kind of operation that changes the user's balance, then it has to uh, require an account status check for that user, okay? Um, in other words, it, it'll call into the EVC and say, hey, I did something to this user's balance. Please record, you know, please make sure it's okay, either now or in the future. Um, and similarly, any operation that affects like the global status of this vault uh, should also do a vault status check. Um, and in this case, uh, the vault doesn't even pass an address into the EBC when it does it. It's implicitly based on the message sender, right? And in fact, both of these operations are grouped together, like amortized in one call. So it's basically just to install both these checks in one uh, in one go. Okay. The important bit uh, is that the EBC is the one who decides when to actually verify. That these these checks are uh, you know have, have changed the state in an acceptable manner. Okay, so that's why I say at the appropriate time the EVC will call back into the necessary vaults, right? Um, and it might be immediately, but if it's in a batch, it will be deferred. Okay, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, first, let's just 
clarify a little bit what I said there, or like step through an example of what I just said, make it more concrete. Let's say that uh, account A has USDC collateral and a WEF borrow, okay? And it calls withdraw on the USDC vault, okay? So in this case, the operation occurs inside the USDC vault. It will actually like, you know, um, well, first of all, make sure that you that the user has that sufficient balance, right? If it doesn't, that would be um, authorization denied. But it, assuming it does, then it would, you know, perform the operation and then it would call uh, the you, into the EVC to record the status checks that need to be occur. Okay, so it would require a status check for A because it's about uh, a user A's balance has changed, and also the vault status check implicitly for itself because the total supply has changed. Then the EVC would determine, okay, for the account status check, EVC has to call into the WEF vault because that is A's controller, right? That is the one that gets the final say about whether this operation is allowed, right? Because if the user tries to um, withdraw too much USDC, it might leave the position unhealthy, which is not allowed, okay? However, uh, the uh, vault status check calls back into the USDC vault because it's, um, the global state has changed, okay? Um, that can sometimes be a little bit of a problem depending on how you write your reentrancy guards because you know, you're in the middle of a withdrawal operation, you call up uh, in the USDC vault, call into the EVC, and then it calls back into the USDC vault to perform, like to actually validate the check. Uh, you can get around that as we saw previously with that call through EVC pattern, uh, and that makes everything just work a lot nicer in, with like typical reentrancy guard patterns. So that's really a suggested way to do it. But technically speaking, it's optional. And if you have a better way to, solve, to handle reentrancy, then feel free. Um, so uh, I didn't actually explain why you might want to do this vault status check. Like, why do we? Why are we checking? You know, why is it vault checking itself? Right? It's kind of a little bit weird, right? Like, why not just fail if some global invariant is violated in the vault? Right? Uh, the reason is that sometimes you want to actually support a transient violation of a vault. Right, um, you know the the best example that we've come up with is the is supply and borrow caps for the vault. Right, um, in, in this case, uh, so what a supply uh, cap is or a borrow cap is are there uh, limits to how much can be deposited in a vault or borrowed from it? Right, um, and it does not allow that to be exceeded. Right, however, sometimes it's quite useful to um, to actually temporarily exceed it. Right, uh, as long as you solve it for the end of the transaction. Okay. Um, uh, the one thing that uh, is a little bit tricky is that uh, it, sometimes it's actually the change in the global state that is uh, it, it is what should be allowed or not. And that's why uh, we have this pattern called snapshotting, right? So the idea is that inside of um, a withdrawal operation or whatever, uh, it would take a little snapshot of what the state was before the operation. And then at the very end, you know, end of the batch after whenever the EVC decides to perform this vault status check, it will check what this, you know, that then current state is relative to the snapshot, right? And, and the idea behind that, uh, and the idea behind that is that you can temporarily, uh, sorry, the idea behind that is that um, if you have a uh, uh, cap that is already exceeded, Right, maybe like uh, it's a supply cap and interest has raised it above there, or let's say uh, the supply cap was installed and like reduced uh, such that it causes a uh, violation. Um, then you still don't want to reject someone who's withdrawing like a little bit, but not enough to solve that violation. Right, like that should still be allowed. Right. So the idea is that uh, you know even if the final state still is in violation of the cap those operations should still be allowed, right? It's just basically as long as it's not getting worse, as long as you're not pushing the cap, uh, pushing whatever violate the metric like supplies uh, away from the cap that's already violated. Um, yeah, so that, that that's basically the use of the vault status check is uh, properties like that that you want to force with the vault. Uh, two questions, uh, one about flash loans. Uh, that flash, flash loans are a little bit of a different operation but yes, the flash loans uh, are first of all supported natively in um, most vaults. Like, there's no reason not to. So the vaults we we will uh, will support that. But also, you can do flash loans just with regular deferrals, right? Um, yeah. Uh, second is, does using EVC cause high gas consumption? Well, it's a matter of uh, matter of debate. I guess it depends on what you're comparing it to. We've got we've um, done quite a bit of work to keep EVC gas usage down. But, um, you know, it, it, it does add a little bit of overhead to some operations, but it benefits you in some other operations. So it, it, 
kind of depends on what you're doing. Um, and also, just as a note, uh, when transient storage comes out, uh, EVC gas usage will go way down as well. All right, let's move on. Um, deferred checks. Yeah, so this, this is kind of uh, solidifying again what I was talking about earlier. Uh, and, and just the fact that the EVC is the one who decides when the check is actually uh, validated, right? Like the vaults request the checks and then the EVC will either check them right now, that is, uh, uh, or, or uh, you know, when you're not deferred, when nothing's deferred, or it will check them later, okay? So, uh, and, and one of the interesting reasons for that is that there are kind of two ways to interact with the vault, right? Either you can interact with the vault directly, that's case number one, okay? That's like you just go to a vault and you call withdraw on it. Uh, in that case, you're not inside a batch, nothing is deferred, so the EVC will call back into the vault right away to verify, or uh, you know, either this vault or the controller of these are requesting the action. It'll do that right away and check to see it's okay, right? But case number two is when it's in a batch and those checks have been deferred, okay? And they will be done at the very end, all right? Uh, so those are, the, those are the two kind of cases, and uh, yeah, Many reason, many use cases for deferred checks, like we were talking about earlier. Um, this is how how you could do a, a flash loan, for example, right? Or what we call like flash liquidity, is you perform some operation that like would cause a temporary violation, uh, like cause a violation. I mean, and uh, it, as long as that violation is only temporary because you solve it later in the batch, you will not cause it will not cause a problem. Okay, um, and. Uh, it's uh, also uh, related to gas usage. Like this, as I said, is one of the ways that um, the EVC can actually benefit you, right? Because if you if you weren't doing deferrals, then after every single operation, you might be doing the status checks, right? You might be checking the account is still back, uh, is still in a um, non-violation state, right? However, if you throw all those operations into one batch, that will only happen once at the very end, right? So especially because checking the state of an account um, involves pricing, for example, uh, this can save a lot of gas. Okay. So that's one of the benefits of deferrals, but I would say most importantly is that ability to transiently violate the, um, transiently violate the, uh, the, the state, as long as you solve it by the end of the batch. Um, one, uh, kind of, I, I guess I would say unique feature of the EVC, although, I mean, I'm sure it's been done in other contexts before, but uh, one uh, thing about the EVC is what we call nested batches. And, and the idea behind that is that if you're inside a batch and another batch is open, you know, by some other contract, then um, the checks deferral continues all the way to the end of the top level batch, all right? Uh, so the, the important reason for this is that this allows contracts to be written in a way that they create their own batches uh, and you know, for the purposes of either saving gas or deferring um, the checks till the end because they expect to transiently violate it and still be usable inside of a top level batch. Okay. So it, as an EOA, you could, could create a top level batch and you know, you defer liquidity, you call into another contract, it creates another batch, does a bunch of operations in there. And then normally we expect the check deferral to happen, happen at the end there. But in fact, it's only at the end of the top level batch that the checks actually happen, right? So everything is very composable by allowing this uh, 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 nesting. Um, obviously infinite is not uh, is not the right word uh, here because there are other constraints like call depth limit and obviously gas, block, block gas limit and so on. But uh, the interesting thing is that there is no EVC enforced limit in the um, in the batch, nest, uh, batch nesting, okay? Uh, so that's nested batches. Um, yeah, sorry, you can hear it. There's, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> a little bit of noise on my side. Uh, yeah, setting up leverage positions. Um, it, it, yeah, I'll just carry on. It should, uh, it, it, I think it'll stop. <laughs> setting up leverage positions. Yeah, so this is, this is just a, an illustration of the mechanics of what we were talking about, about the check deferrals and so on. Um, Without deferred checks, imagine you do this sequence of operations. You borrow WEF and then you swap into, into USDC and then you deposit that USDC, right? If you didn't have any other uh, collateral available in your account, um, then it would fail, okay? Uh, because the borrow operation would fail. After that borrow, you're in a, in a, you're in a, a violation state, okay? However, with the deferred checks, uh, that, the, that check it doesn't actually happen then it waits until the very end, 
right? So here you can see that that final operation, the deposit USDC, solves the account status uh, check um, uh, and therefore there is no violation and it passes, okay? So this is like the the step-by-step -step mechanics of how you know a deferral works inside of a batch. Um, the EBC is 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 quite flexible and uh, it's kind of neat because we don't actually have to encode any sort of swapping logic anywhere in our systems. Vaults don't need to have anything special for swapping. The EBC doesn't have anything special for swapping. Um, the way that the multi-call system actually works. Uh, potentially combined with what we call like helper contracts uh, is sufficient for any sort of swapping or wrapping or any other any other um, things you might need to do inside of a, a nested batch. Okay, um, there's actually many different ways you can accomplish this, but here's one possible flow: uh, you could have these this special contract called like a, a handler or helper, and uh, you could uh, you know obviously this would be a, a well audited trusted contract, uh, but a, you still will put restrictions on it inside of your batch, okay? So the idea is that your first item in your batch, you would withdraw in amount tokens and then send that directly to the handler, right? Because if you remember, or if you've seen the 4626 specification, the withdraw method has a parameter of where the tokens go, right? So you send it directly to the handler. And then you could call the handler in a second batch item with the swapping instructions, right? Like what you wanna swap it into, maybe there's some different parameters from of the decks you've chosen to use um, and so on. And what it will do is what the what the handler will be coded to do is perform the swap in your operation and deposit the resulting tokens into whatever address you specify. That's like another method on the you know um, invoke method of the handler, whatever it's called. And then finally, another item could just verify that your token balance increased according to whatever slippage uh, tolerance you want, right? So that'd be like the min expected out amount, right? And, and the interesting thing about this is that the handler isn't actually really that it's not really just part of the trusted code base necessarily, right? Like there's not really anything it could do except send you back to few tokens, in which case their item number three would fail, right? So uh, there's all kinds of different ways you can set up these batches, especially when they're combined with like, you know, semi-trusted, but not not even part of the trusted code base handler methods uh, that allow you to do all kinds of different operations, right? Uh, and I should say that the obvious way to use the EBC might be to transit tokens into it directly, but that's not really recommended for a bunch of reasons. You can read in the white paper and it's better to use like handlers if possible. Uh, so yeah, just to, to wrap up the um, concept about the status checks, how do they actually get validated? How do, how do contracts actually, like the vaults, I mean, how do they actually say whether or not it's um, uh, an account is in violation, right? Um, well, to do that, they expose these two methods, check vault status and check account status. And really the idea behind them is that the EVC will invoke them um, anytime it thinks is appropriate. And the vault should you know, then read the state on chain, um, possibly also with the, a snapshot that was taken in the case of vault status check, but read whatever state on chain is. And then if it's acceptable, then, um, then uh, proceed, otherwise revert. When you proceed, by the way, you have to return this special special value. It's like a, a special Sentinel value. It's just the selector of the method. Um, that's pretty common with a lot of VRCs, so that you know you, you can't like accidentally install the wrong vault or whatever, right? Con a wrong contract for a vault. And, but uh, anyway, what does it mean? How should a vault decide whether or not to allow it uh, to allow um, the state or not? Right. Well, that's vault specific, and that's one of the interesting and powerful things we think about the EDC design, uh, in that. Every different vault could have its own metrics about what it means to be healthy or not, right? Uh, and, and you know that has a lot of consequences um, that will become like more clear over time. But one of the things I want to call it right now is that uh, it means that there isn't necessarily a global pricing view any longer, right? And nor should there really be. But um, you know you can think of a lot of lending platforms; they have like one price for let's say USDC, right, or WATH or whatever. Uh, each one of those has like an official price that affects all of the different lending contracts in that system, right? Uh, but not so here. It, it is, uh, each vault could have its own view on how to price an asset, right? Um, and, you know, that uh, could even be, uh, and it's, it's not necessarily tied to even the collateral vault, which is, I think, interesting, right? You could have a collateral vault that has USDC and it has its own opinions about pricing stuff, you know, if it needs to, if it's sports borrowing as well. but its assets, it's like it's uh, it could be entirely priced separately based on the different vaults that use it as a collateral, and it knows nothing about that, right? 
So it's just, it's kind of an interesting structure. And um, there'll be more to talk about when we unveil the fall kit. Uh, another thing that's related to batches and in multi-call and so on in the EVC is the this notion of simulations. Um, based on our experience with Euler V1, in order to build like a really good UI, in our opinion, you need to actually like have, uh, have um, multiple operations composed into one sort of uh, cluster or bat, uh, like batch, uh, for example, uh, that you execute as a single transaction. Okay, uh, it, it's 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 a very poor user experience to have to like you know deposit, like you know click deposit and then go to MetaMask and accept and then da 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 da, da and then wait for it to be mined and then create another one to like do borrow or whatever. Right? It'd be it's much much nicer and better for the users if you can like construct all those things before you do anything on the blockchain and kind of. Uh, visualize what the effect would be before you do anything, all right? And and in V1, we had this thing called the transaction builder. We're going to have it in, in, the, in the subsequent VIs as well. Um, but the idea is that you can, you know, go onto the uh, website, perform a bunch of operations, and see them accrue uh, onto the transaction builder. Uh, and the, here's the really interesting thing, is that every time you add something to the uh, builder, the values change in the rest of the website. Right. So as soon as you add the deposit item to your builder, you see, okay, you immediately have a balance. Okay, great. You can go and do a borrow, right? And it will succeed because you have the balance. And let's say you've entered into collateral as well, right? But all of that happens before you've even sent the transaction, right? And that way you can actually uh, see the exact effect of all of the combined operations you're going to put in your builder you know, in, in before you do anything, right? So. Uh, there's a lot of actual tricks to making this work, um, and we we went through down a many different like kind of not perfect uh, iterations of this. But uh, based on all of our experience, we figured out what we think is the best way to do like simulations in a batch, right? And that's part of the EVC. Um, it's really easy to use. Instead of calling batch, all you do is call batch simulation, okay? If you remember, I said the batch doesn't return anything. Um, that's typically the way you want it because it would be kind of a waste of gas to like actually have a return data, right? Uh, in most cases, right? If you're just sending a transaction, like as an EUA, you're sending a transaction and it's ca uh, calling UC and doing a batch, then that ret any like val uh, work returning stuff, uh, like putting into memory and actually calling like return opcodes and whatever is um, wasted, right? It's like, it, 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 it's not useful. So that's why batch doesn't, but batch simulation does, okay? And what it does is every single item in the batch, whatever that call is to whatever contract it's calling, uh, is uh, returned as well, okay? Uh, and, and the way that you uh, would use this in like what I talked about the website simulation is that after doing a bunch of the operations uh, that the user requested, you would put a bunch of calls to different view methods on the end of the batch, right? Maybe like a big lens operation that, uh, that, that does it. Um, so uh, batch simulation, good question in the chat, if batch simulation is a view function, uh, Actually, no, I don't believe it is. Uh, the reason for that is the final bullet point here about how it actually, in fact, works, right? It, it, it's the, the, the way it works is um, it actually does the operations in a batch simulation, right? It, 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 uh, it, it just that it relies on the fact that you can revert a transaction and undo all of those effects, right? So uh, it's a little bit of a trick here in that it actually uh the sorry the evc actually calls itself it calls this batch revert method uh and and um but it doesn't in a try catch right and it makes sure that it always reverts right otherwise it itself reverts and in fact we've formally proven that it always reverts uh but after after it does that the exception data like if we if we had just like bubbled that up as part of the transaction that was one of our iterations we went through too but we had a lot of problems with like different nodes mangling the data or inserting their own stuff or uh, like different um, uh, libraries like ethers and stuff. Have, uh, we're, we're not doing it correctly on, on older versions and all kinds of stuff. So the better way that we found is actually to convert that error data into regular data and return it like that, right? And this way we think it will work everywhere, right? So it's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, I think sort of a nice solution and um, we think it'll be useful for people building all kinds of UIs, right? Because uh, uh, because it's just such a better way to build transactions than uh, you know, step by step. Uh, 
that brings me to the next feature of the EVC, which is permit. Okay, and uh, the idea behind this is that uh, rather than creating a blockchain transaction directly um, that invokes the EVC, you can create a permit message uh, and sign it. Uh, you know, with the, the EIP seven one two message schema. Like you, you, you've probably done this before for approvals, right? Like many different token contracts will allow you to approve access to your tokens without sending a, a transaction by signing this permit method, right? And then it's, for example, bundled along with a swap operation, right? So the, uh, the EVC's permit is just like that, except it's more general purpose, right? It's not just giving access to the tokens, but it's in fact an entire batch, right? So uh, you could imagine this as being sort of like a gasless transaction, right? Because you can do anything you could inside of a regular batch invocation, but invoked from permit, right? Invoked by some entirely unrelated user, right? Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of reasons why they might want to do that on your behalf, but usually you'd be you know, tipping them in some way. You'll be giving them some kind of compensation, right? Is a replacement for gas. Um, yeah, and uh, just the last point is that uh, the E... Uh, the EVC also supports this with smart contract wallets. There's an ERC 1271 that basically calls back into the smart contract wallet and asks if this operation is allowed. So uh, it should work okay with you know your, your NOSIS safes and whatnot. So um, some of the use cases for uh, permit, uh, as I said, gasless transactions, right? That's if you want to build some kind of UI that um, you know doesn't require the user to pay in, in, with native token for every operation. Maybe they could pay with uh, you know just um, some you know, stable token, or, or maybe they could in fact pay with shares from one of the vaults you're interacting with, right? Because we know for sure a user has that if they're setting up leverage positions, right? So it might be that just like you pay for this gastrous transaction by like shaving off a tiny bit of your collateral, right? Um, but anyway, that's all of the scope of, of it. But, uh, but um, yeah, the EVC itself uh, enables this, uh, this batch, uh, this, this like, another level of authentication where a separate user uh, can invoke something on your path, but you've authorized it by signing the message off chain. Okay. Um, uh, and it, uh, like I said before, EVC is quite flexible and there's uh, just like there was no reason to encode swapping or anything like that into the EVC itself. There is also no reason to include, include a, a tipping type mechanism. And there's all kinds of ways you can layer contracts on to support this. Um, but uh, one of the ways is just you have a, a smart contract that uh, a keeper calls and installs their own address, and then that calls the batch thing, right? Like installs reentrancy guard, so no one else can change it while it's happening. But that calls the batch, right? That you install, right? And then one of the items in your batch would be to read the value from that contract and send, uh, you know, a tip there, right? Whether that's a fixed amount or, um, or, or, or otherwise. Uh, question in the chat is if the EVC accepts any fees. It does not. And uh, Euler does not make money directly on the EVC. Uh, we think of it as sort of a public good contract. Uh, but you know, there's a, a big advantage to creating an ecosystem, and we think there will be all kinds of benefits for you know for the uh, participants of that ecosystem, which um, is what we're trying to build. Uh, I said earlier a little bit about how you can put. Um, what we call conditions as batch items. Uh, these are really just another example of something you, uh, another contract you interact with in your batch, right? And it relies on the fact that if you, if one of those contracts throws an error, then the entire batch will throw an error, right? So just like there's no reason to put special swapping stuff or fee stuff, or like tipping uh, mechanisms into the EVC, there's not re any reason to put something like an expire, right? Uh, you know, like a lot of transactions, um, a lot of uh, off-chain transactions will have like some kind of like uh, expiry uh, mechanism in them, or, you know, maybe it's not good until a certain date time. Like uh, you, you want this to be mined, not now, but in, uh, you know, in 20 minutes from now, for example, all of those are possible by calling it like a, some kind of condition type contract, right? And here you can see like a very trivial implementation of an expires one, right? So this would be the contract that is installed. Um, I mean, I guess you could get it audited, but hardly necessary here, right? Uh, especially because it's also outside of the trusted code base, remember, right? Uh, we are invoking this expires method in a batch item and passing in a timestamp, right? And if the batch evaluates and that require triggers, then the batch will be reverted. So therefore this, like if it's a gasless transaction, 
would not be mineable anymore, right? And people could discard it. The keepers could discard it from their mempool, right? If they wanted to. Uh, and uh, there's uh, a lot more type advanced type of um, orders, uh, modifiers, and conditions, and so on that you could do with this. Uh, like I was saying, there's the time conditions. That's like before and after. You could even you could check prices, right? You could make it so that these off chain orders are not mineable until a price has actually been triggered, right? Maybe that's what you're trading, or maybe an entirely separate price, right? Uh, any, any other on chain metric you could put into these kind of conditions, right? To to uh, to determine whether the order should be uh, useful or not. Uh, so yeah, this is what we were. Uh, There's a question earlier about uh, if you know batches make sense for building uh, trading bots. Uh, I would say yes, absolutely. And there, you know, if you look at CFI kind of mechanisms. There's brokers that have, give you extremely powerful types of conditional or contingent orders, right? You can create very complicated orders that only trigger under certain scenarios. You can do all that with batches, right? That's that's kind of our, our vision for this. Um, just an, uh, yeah, and another thing you think of is that these are the the gasless transactions can also be used to implement like resting orders, right? Uh, orders that exist uh, off chain in a mempool, and only when certain conditions are triggered are they executable. Okay. Uh, Another kind of interesting mechanism is uh, you could actually look at the execution status of another order, right? In that case, you could make it so that, you know, this order has to execute after another order or, uh, you know, if you execute this order, it guarantees to cancel this other order, right? Or it enables the conditions that allow this other order to be executed, right? So uh, you can kind of compose them in quite advanced ways like that, which brings us to the nonce system on permit, right? Permit actually has some of this sequencing stuff built in. Uh, on Ethereum, there's every transaction you send has a nonce as well, right? I'm sure you're familiar with it, right? It's that number, uh, like the transaction number associated with it, and it starts at zero for every account or whatever, and increases once for every transaction you send, okay? Uh, and your transactions have to be mined in that nonce order, right? Like if you've mined up to transaction two, you can't mine transaction four yet. Three has to come first, right? Uh, and that's actually a very important thing, just because the sequencing of transactions is sometimes, you know, an important um, uh, semantic uh, uh, property of the transactions that you created them, right? Like, you know, if you think about it, if you're doing deposit and borrow separately, uh, you know, traditionally with the defer batch deferrals and whatever, then you really want that deposit to happen first. Otherwise, both uh, otherwise they're both going to fail. Uh, the, the the borrow will fail, right? Um, but if you have unrelated transactions, that could be actually quite counterproductive, okay? So, uh, you know, this comes up with some accounts, right? As we said, they're totally isolated. Maybe you do want them to have be in independent, right? And trading on this one, you know, shouldn't uh, put sequencing obligations on trading on the other one, right? Um, and this is also very useful for contingent orders too, as I'll say in a second here. But uh, the solution for the EVC is this thing called nonce namespaces, right? So uh, every, like, Top level account, right? This is not sub level, sub uh, sub account level, but uh, but, but the actual um, top level uh, account, which is obviously the one, only one that can sign permit messages, right? Uh, has um, an unlimited number of these non name spaces, right? Um, actually, it's U and two fifty six, so there is a limit, but effectively unlimited number, right? Each one of those you can think of as a different like sequencing stream. Okay, so whenever you create a permit message, you choose the nonce namespace you want to live in, and then inside that nonce namespace, it works exactly like the um, Ethereum style in order type sequencing, right? So what you can do is uh, customize it, right? On uh, totally unrelated orders that you don't care about the sequencing, you might choose a random nonce namespace each time, or maybe like the hash of the the batch or something like that, and in which case they can execute in any order, right? Or if you want to go to the Ethereum style, you just use zero as your nonce namespace and increase uh, uh, the, the nonce by one for each transaction and get a totally sequenced, right? right? One, right? However, you could do hybrids of them, right? Uh, and have diff you know, multiple different sequences running in parallel. And with the contingent orders, if you look at the nonce namespace state inside of your batch of another one, you can actually merge these things in together, right? So these two orders can have append in any sequence, but only after they're both completed is this third order allowed to execute, right? So uh, this is uh, where uh, this is the the mechanism for that. Oh, the question from the chat is where is the nonce namespace stored? Uh, it's stored in the EVC. Yeah, the EVC keeps track for um, of of the nonce value for each nonce namespace that has been used by each account. Yeah, there's a mapping. Uh, so yeah, the, just going to wrap up now. But uh, as I was saying before, is almost all these things, all these features are related to authentication, right? 
EVC is the um, uh, EVC in the, the ecosystem's role is for it to do uh, per, uh, perform the authentication of operations, right? Uh, and you know, typically the vaults will perform authorization. Okay, so all of these things: the, the controller's access to the collateral, so the sub accounts, operators, the gasless transactions, AK permit. Um, those things are authentication related. Okay, so that's really the the wheelhouse of UVC. And we think the separation concerns is, is, is important and valuable. But uh, the, the EVC, of course, wouldn't exist without the vaults, right? It would be useless without vaults, right? So what, what our vision is, is for a, like a network of liquidity. And, uh, you know, that's nice because we want people to be able to create lots of different vaults and experiment with different vault configurations and settings and so on and so forth using our vault kit or otherwise. Uh, but the really nice thing about this is that if you want to get your little lending protocol off the ground, you, there's not really any coordination from that you need for to with any other vaults right you can just pick any other vaults you want and use them as collateral and everything just kind of works okay so you know the idea is that on day one you should be able to offer a relatively competitive net interest rate to your to your cost to your borrowers right uh yeah so that's really the the the, the point of the epc yeah, the, of the of the vault model is to like be able to bootstrap this liquidity uh and Another thing, just as like little teaser here, is that uh, we put quite a bit of work into making it so that the vaults can be nested. And what that means is if you use the share tokens for one vault as the underlying of another vault, everything actually works, right? And you have to be a little bit careful because of, you know, the typical patterns of reentrancy guards and so on would cause problems here. But um, this pattern, when it works, is uh, going to unlock a whole bunch of different new potential of vault creation stuff. We'll, 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 you know, follow us if you want to learn more about that in the future. Uh, so just like uh workshop two we all we have some more assignments um there's a questionnaire that uh, will be available uh, at this website shortly if not already and um there's also a uh, another prize pool for it and uh also there's a coding assignment this is a little bit open-ended follow that link and read a little bit more um and obviously reach out if you have any questions or, or comments or you want to know if anything's a good idea or not I'm happy to help you with that and uh yeah, there's also the bug bounty um, on the EVC website. And uh, oops, <laughs> I left. Uh, okay, so I, I, I did leave a fix me in there. So mention ETH Den mention Denver Hackathon. Yeah, we'll be attending the ETH Denver um, Hackathon at the end of February. So if you're around for that, please come see us uh, and hack if you like. I think uh, Dan will maybe have a little more information to share in a second after the, uh, for that. Uh, but yeah, the resources, evc.wtf, that's got everything you need. Um, and then here's our GitHub pages uh, for the EVC itself and also the EVC playground, which is a really good way to see kind of like a, a, a minimal prototype vault system that when you work with EVC. Uh, our vault kit system will be uh, more, um, uh, more flexible, but it, the EVC playground will give you a good idea of, of what it, it entails. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot. Uh, for attending and your attention and look forward to talking to you soon. Uh, thanks, Dan and Encode. It's been great. Thank you so much, Doug. So the Ethereum Vault Connector is the start of Euler's vision to build a modular lending ecosystem. It's going to serve as the core building block of Euler V2, enabling it to be more flexible and to place stronger emphasis on risk management and yield optimization. Um, Euler, much like Encode Club, will be over in Denver next month. Um, I hope to see you guys there. And this will give you all the opportunity to once again delve into the uh, Ethereum Vault Connector development and to compete for some really exciting bounties there. Um, from my end, I'd like to thank Doug and the whole team at Euler for joining us for this Educate series. Um, it's been really fun to work with you guys. And I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for tuning in. I'll hopefully catch you all soon, but I wish you all good evenings. Yeah.